Disintegrate. <laughs> he needs help. I am mentally divergent. I, I am mentally ill. I am mentally divergent. I am mentally ill. Didn't make it be Didn't yesterday. Make it be yesterday. Just couldn't turn Just couldn't back couldn't time. Turn back time. I want to stay here this time with you. Thanks for watching my analysis of director Terry Gilliam's 1995 American science fiction film, 12 Monkeys, written by David and Janet Peoples, based on Chris Marker's 1962 film, La Jete, and starring Bruce Willis as James Cole, Madeline Stowe as Catherine Raleigh, Frank Gorshin as Dr. Fletcher, and Brad Pitt as Jeffrey Goins. Here you come. Before I get started, I would appreciate it if you would subscribe to The Godfather of Cinema. Movie reviews and more, give this video a thumbs up, leave a comment and hit the bell so that you won't miss any new videos that I'll upload in the future. The head is where everything starts and what's insane today will be normal tomorrow. In the year 1996, the army of the 12 monkeys are responsible for a virus that wipes out 3 billion people or 99% of the human population. The remaining 1% of the human population is forced to live underground because of the virus. It's couldn't turn back time. In 1917, a time traveler is accidentally sent to the French trenches of World War I. And in 1990, this same time traveler is accidentally sent to a mental hospital. And it is here that James Cole meets psychiatrist Catherine Catherine Raley, who is quite sure that he is not from the future and that she is not the woman he saw in his dream. But he needs help. To her, Cole is a crazed fanatic until police find the little boy who had fallen into a shaft alive in a barn. Cole told her that it was all a hoax and he was right. But could he also be right about the virus? Could she be one of the three billion people he said would die? Is he from the future and are they really living in the past? If so, then they will make the most of every moment that they both have together in the present. If you are watching this film analysis of 12 Monkeys, then you already know that this film is about time travel. But what you probably don't know is that 12 Monkeys' true meaning is hidden in something that L.J. Washington and Jeffrey Goins says to main character James Cole at the mental hospital. In this video, I will give you the key to 12 Monkeys and hopefully an even greater appreciation for the film's incredible writing and direction and why it is a among the greatest science fiction films ever made and be sure to stay to the end of this video for a few surprising facts about 12 monkeys that you may not know so let's get started I, I am mentally ill to Cole reality is the past present future and a dream wait Sometime in the future, in a deep underground bunker, six scientists recruit a prisoner named James Cole for a special mission. In exchange for a reduced sentence, he is to travel back in time to the year 1996 to find a group called the Army of the Twelve Monkeys who plan on using a virus to wipe out the human population. After locating this virus, Cole is to then travel back to the future to report to the scientists, who will then send a qualified scientist back to the year 1996 to study the virus and to develop a vaccine that will enable the scientists and the human race to return to the surface and subjugate the animals that have taken control of the planet. But instead of being sent to 1996, the right year, Cole ends up in a mental hospital in 1990, the wrong year. And this is where the line between reality and fantasy gets confusing for him. <laughs> because for one, the past seems more real than the future. All of the doctors at the mental hospital look exactly like the scientists in the future. The isolation cell at the hospital is exactly like his prison cell in the future. 
and there is even a spider at the hospital like the one that he found in the future. And if the line between reality and fantasy isn't bad enough, it gets more confusing for Cole because the head doctor at the hospital, the head scientist from the future, and one of the travelers in his recurring dream at the airport all look the same. Cole meets another patient at the hospital who cannot distinguish reality from fantasy named L.J. Washington who believes that he is on the planet Ogo. I don't really come from outer space. However, he is also aware that this fantasy is a psychic construct that he uses to cope with reality. Cole is brought back to the future and sent back in time to the correct year, 1996, to track down the leader of the Army of the Twelve Monkeys, who also happens to be a former patient that Cole met at the mental hospital in 1990. However, Goins accuses Cole of starting the virus. <laughs> When they were in the day room at the hospital watching television, Cole was upset that day about the desecration of the planet and told Jeffrey that it would be great if a germ or a virus would wipe out mankind without affecting the plants and animals with all of the drugs that the doctors and scientists forced him to take. Cole is no longer sure of whether he actually told Jeffrey this or not, despite the fact that the scientists selected him for having a strong mind and the ability to recall that he is a time traveler from the future sent to the year 1996 to find a group called the Army of the Twelve Monkeys who are responsible for starting a virus that will kill three billion people. In 1990, however, a psychiatrist named Catherine Raley explains to him that the human race was not going to be wiped out by a virus, that he isn't getting secret messages on her car radio, and that she is not the woman of his recurring dream at the airport. He had subconsciously put her in the dream after meeting her as far as she is concerned all of his beliefs are fantasies that he constructed to escape something that is plaguing him in real life. I am mentally divergent. In fact, Catherine Raley is certain that doomsday scenarios are the products of crazed fanatics. Right, he needs help. In April 1162, a crazed fanatic in West England prophesied that a pestilence would wipe out humanity. Police arrested the man for raping a woman. However, he disappeared while in custody and was never heard from again. In 1917, during World War I, another crazed fanatic, a wounded French soldier, lost the ability to speak French and began speaking fluent English, claiming that he was a time traveler from the future looking for a pure germ that would kill most of mankind in 1996, like James Cole. This French soldier vanishes while being treated in the hospital for his wounds and was never seen or heard from again. Now, let's go back to the mental hospital and patient L.J. Washington who believes that he is part of an intellectual elite on planet Ogo and that they are preparing to subjugate barbarian hordes on planet Pluto. In Cole's world, the intellectual elite are the scientists over the prisoners in the bunker. In 1990, the intellectual elite are the doctors including Catherine Raley. Right, he needs help. Over the patients at the mental hospital, the barbarian hordes in L.J. Washington's mind construct of my psyche are synonymous with society and the monkeys in Dr. Mason's lab experiments. The mental patients at the hospital and prisoners in the future like cold that scientists use as guinea pigs for time travel experiments are the crazed fanatics or deviants who challenge the intellectual elite's control over the collective mind of society. 
For instance, as soon as Cole shows up in 1990 without a criminal record, a driver's license, or a social security card, the police beat him and arrest him for not having a criminal record, a driver's license, or a social security card before turning him over to the mental hospital where he meets Jeffrey Goins, who tells him that he isn't crazy at all and that most of the patients in the hospital aren't crazy either. On the contrary, all of the crazy people are those who are enslaved to old ways of thinking and consumer goods. <laughs> Jeffrey also tells Cole about a waiter dropping his burger on the floor, wiping it off and giving it to him. Give me a sandwich, man. Like it was okay, even though it is a proven fact that germs make people sick and society, the same society that defined him and Cole as insane, defined this waiter as sane. And this is also why Dr. Peters disagrees with Catherine's definition of sanity at her lecture. As far as Dr. Peters is concerned, people will splurge on consumer goods like everything is fine, while the whole world is going to hell in a handbasket. And speaking of the same rational people in society who need to be protected from the crazy people, Jeffrey's father Malcolm Goins is a Nobel Prize winning virologist who conducts experiments on live animals by locking them up in cages, giving them jolts of electricity to measure their reactions, injecting them with radioactive fluids to measure their bowel movements and other atrocities. But the same doctors of the mental hospital abuse human beings like James Cole by locking them up in cages, forcing them to take drugs, and subjecting them to torture and inhumane experiments. But the sane and rational scientists of the engineering office of the future world treat Cole and other prisoners no better than animals, locking them up in tiny cells, forcing them to take drugs and using them in time travel experiments. Now, let's Let's go back to L.J. Washington who believes that he is part of an intellectual elite on planet Ogo preparing to subjugate barbarian hordes on Pluto. As I've explained, the intellectual elite are the agents of social control, meaning the doctors at the mental hospital and the scientists of the future. And as I've also explained, the barbarian hordes is society. So the question is how does the intellectual elite plan on subjugating the barbarian hordes on Pluto? Let's start at the mental hospital and Jeffrey comparing himself and other patients to viruses that the hospital must protect the outside world from by not allowing them to make phone calls. Calm. The reason for this, Jeffrey believes, is that the hospital is afraid of the patients infecting the world with the idea that you don't have to buy a lot of stuff to be a good citizen. So the first way that the intellectual elite plan on controlling the barbarian hordes on Pluto is by cutting those who are enlightened, the viruses, off from those who are not enlightened, the consumers. Why do you think I blew up your condo? Now, why do the scientists need the original strain of the virus anyway? Because the original strain of the virus represents the truth that the so-called crazy people use to free consumers and the animals from their cages in the zoo. Therefore, if the scientists can find the truth and stop it from spreading and mutating, they can regain control of Earth. The second way that the intellectual elite plan on subjugating the barbarian hordes on Pluto is by persecution. Such as 19th century Hungarian physician Ignaz Philipp Zemmelweis, who was one of the earliest proponents of hand washing in obstetrical clinics. At that time, the most common cause of miscarriages was purple or childhood fever caused by doctors not washing their hands. Doctors took offense at Zemmelweis' suggestion that germs from their dirty hands caused miscarriages and mothers to die during childbirth.
After all, Zimmerweis could not scientifically prove his theory. However, while working in the Vienna General Hospital's first obstetrical clinic, he had the midwives there to disinfect their hands with a chlorinated lime solution, which resulted in child death rates that were a third lower than childbirths by doctors without midwives. Under Zimmerweis's supervision, mortality rates during childbirth fell below 1%. Nevertheless, the medical community ridiculed Zimmerweis and downplayed his views on hand washing. And when Zimmerweis suffered a nervous breakdown, his colleagues committed him to an asylum where guards beat him until he died from a gangrene infection in his right hand. Also, speaking of someone being persecuted, James Cole is committed to a mental hospital and subjected to inhumane experiments including shock therapy and drugs for claiming to be a time traveler from the future and for claiming that a virus will wipe out most of the human race in 1996. By the end of the film, he's a mental wreck and a fugitive for telling the truth. And after putting forth a long good fight against the intellectual elite, Cole begins to lose faith. He isn't sure anymore of what is real, of what is in his mind, of the future or of the past. Like Blueberry Hill, one moment he hears the song in Rayleigh's car and the next moment he wakes up with the scientist standing around his bed singing it. When he tells Catherine that she is in his dream, she explains to him that he had subconsciously put her in his dream after they met. Did he hear Blueberry Hill in Catherine's car because the scientists in the future were seeing it? Was Catherine always the woman in his dream or is she the woman in his dream because he is losing his mind or had he already lost it? <laughs> Cole is not sure of anything anymore except for one thing. When he is with Catherine, he can see the ocean, feel wind on his face, and hear the seagulls. And because of this, Cole makes peace with the fact that he cannot exist in two worlds and pleads with the scientists to send him back to 1996 to find the original virus that will enable them to take back control of the planet. But when they send Cole back to 1996, he uses a knife to take two teeth out of his mouth <laughs> so that they cannot track his whereabouts anymore. He isn't going back to the future and there won't be any more confusion or divergence because he has made up his mind to give up his future for a past that he has already lived and cannot change in any way. But like a good movie that he has seen many times, he always sees new things each time that he goes back to the past. He's different. Therefore, the way he sees the past, though it never changes, is different. Having reconciled reality in his mind, Cole is now well. I want to stay here this time. And so is Catherine Raleigh, who was also sure of her world and what was real until the police find the nine-year-old boy who had supposedly fallen into a well. The boy had been hiding in a barn all along, just like Cole told her he'd be. How did you know that was just a hoax? And then the clincher. The police call her about the bullet that she took out of Cole's leg. That bullet had been fired prior to 1920, which prompts Catherine to check the old World War I photo she used in her book. Cole is in the photo as she, he claims, was always the woman in his dream. However, her former boss, Dr. Fletcher, reminds her to be rational. Cole is insane. Time travel is impossible and a virus is not going to kill three billion people, but it's too late. There will be no more confusion for Catherine anymore and no more divergence. Catherine now knows that she has been living a life that is already predetermined because she is already dead from the virus. But at least she can be with Cole and they can live the last moments of their lives together. This moment, the only one that they truly have, the present. 
Here's a few things you may or may not know about 12 Monkeys. Did you know that actor Brad Pitt was nominated for the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor? but that Bruce Willis wasn't recognized by the Academy with a Best Actor nomination what? <laughs> for his performance, which is, in my opinion, the film's best performance. And speaking of Bruce Willis, did you know that he took a major pay cut in order to get the film approved for production? This was due to cost overruns on Universal's 1995 Kevin Costner film, Waterworld. Did you know that to prepare for his role as Jeffrey Goins, actor Brad Pitt spent weeks in the psychiatric ward at Temple University studying its patients. Even so, Terry Gilliam did not buy into casting Brad Pitt for the role and Pitt took a considerably small salary, being that he was not the star then that he is today. Did you know that there were no sound stages used in the film and that all of the scenes were shot in abandoned buildings and landmarks in Pennsylvania and Milwaukee? Did you know that this film has a connection with Ridley Scott's 1982 science fiction masterpiece, Blade Runner? David Peoples, who wrote the script for Blade Runner, also co-wrote this film with his wife, Janet Peoples. And speaking of Blade Runner, did you know that my favorite film critic, Roger Ebert, said that he found the depictions of the future in Blade Runner and 12 Monkeys to be similar? Ebert also went on to say that 12 Monkeys appeals more to the mind than to the senses, an opinion I agree with having read the script many times to prepare this film analysis. Once again, thanks for watching my analysis of director Terry Gilliam's 1995 dystopian science fiction film 12 Monkeys and be sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the Godfather of Cinema and hit the bell for more film related videos like this one. I will see you soon.